folks, it's 2017 and with a new year begins a new season for me and Shasta reviewing stuff for you guys. So welcome to season two. Anyway, I'd like to give a few announcements before starting the review. Firstly, as you folks have already noticed, my intro is now different. It's now shorter and I'm using different music. Just a heads up, my ending credits will also be different. The reason behind this is because with my first intro and credits, I was using music that was copyrighted, which meant that many of my reviews from Season 1 were blocked in some countries. So due to YouTube's policies with music, I can no longer use ZZ Top's Give Me All Your Lovin' and Leonard Skinner's Coming Home for my intro and credits. It's strange. I can review an entire band's album as long as I use the song in the background, but I can't use any song proper without any noise. Eh, it's YouTube's rules, not mine. So with that said, I'm going to also be changing the song, most notably Leonard Skinner's Coming Home, in my older videos so that they'll no longer be blocked in certain countries, and also so I can reach a wider audience. Also, it's come to my attention that my intros were too long. They ran from almost a minute to uh, about a minute and ten seconds. I guess you could say I was being a little too creative with them. They were just too long. And let's face it, you folks didn't come to see my intro, you came to see my review. Yeah, they're pretty good. My last announcement before we get to the review is starting in February, I'm going to be kicking off a yearly special known as FPFs Month. Basically, throughout the month of February, I'm going to review nothing but first-person shooter games. tell you why. Besides platformers and RPGs, FPS games are my all-time favorite. So since I love the genre so much, I might as well devote an entire month to it. Well... You're not going to like this one, Shaz. We're reviewing Back to the Future on the NES. Don't we all, my four-legged friend? Don't we all? Last season in my Super Nintendo Jurassic Park review, I mentioned a company that shall not be named. Well, that company was LJN. It was inevitable. I was going to have to eventually cover an LJN game. Seems to be the fate of anyone who reviews video games here on YouTube. So, what's LJN in this game's story, anyway? LJN was originally a toy company established in 1970 by this man, Jack Friedman, whom, prior to creating LJN, was originally a salesman for another company that sold novelty and plush toys. Throughout the 70s and early 80s, LJN had enjoyed success with their cartoon and TV show licensed toy lines. This eventually got MCA Universal's attention, whom in 1985 bought LJN for around $66 million. After the acquisition, Mr. Friedman left LJN and created a new company called THQ. But that's another story. The idea on MCA's end was simple. Universal would make a movie, and in turn, LJN would make a toy line and a video game based on said movie. And as some of you folks may know, MCA was already familiar with the video game industry, most notably their dealings with Atari. So their plan seemed foolproof. Well, in terms of toys it was, 
but in terms of video games, it was not. Bad game after bad game after bad game had lost MCA quite a great deal of money throughout the late 80s. By 1990, MCA had had enough, and they decided to sell LJN to Acclaim. At this point, LJN's toy making days were over, as Acclaim decided to steer their direction towards video games exclusively. In 1995, LJN was folded completely into Acclaim, and they ceased as a company only to be bought back in name only for the release of Acclaim's racing game, Spirit of Speed, 1937. So, that's LJN's tale. But what about Back to the Future and its development? To be honest, I couldn't find much. Yeah, when it comes to most LJN games, not much is to be said about their development. However, I did find one thing that's pretty interesting. During the development of this game, Bob Gale, the guy who wrote the screenplay for the Back to the Future trilogy wanted to see how the game was being made so that he could possibly give LJN the proper guidance in its development. LJN, though, would have none of that, and Mr. Gale was refused the request to see the game's progress. Eventually, though, LJN did show him the game, and what he saw he didn't like. He tried to tell LJN to make some changes, but LJN pretty much responded with, Up, oh, no, nope, can't do that, sorry, game's already finished. This led to Mr. Gale criticizing the game and calling it, quote unquote, one of the worst games ever. That sentence from Bob Gale alone should be enough for you folks to stay away from this game. But I'm a show don't tell kind of redneck, so. Let's begin the review. I feel sorry for me too, but tis the duty of one who critiques. So the game starts off fine enough, but then you press start and, uh... The problems begin already. Wow, I've barely begun and the problems already start. That's not a good sign. Firstly, let's take a look at Marty. Looks a little strange, doesn't he? Yeah, if anything, his shirt should be red like his jacket from the movie, and his hair should be brown. I don't know why LJN made Marty look like this. Maybe it was just easier to animate. It's a minor flaw, but one worth noting. The game has way worse flaws than that, I can personally assure you. Most of the game, 80% of it, consists of you jogging around 1955 Hill Valley, collecting clocks and avoiding shit. Now many of you might say, why collect the clocks? For points? I don't need points, let's just hightail it to the end of the level. Well, I would do that, but it turns out that you need to collect the clocks in order for you not to die before reaching the end of the level. This is how it works. You see that picture on the bottom of the screen? That's supposed to be the photo of Marty, his brother, and his sister from the movie. And just like in the movie, Marty and his siblings are starting to fade from existence. You have to collect the clocks so that you won't cease to exist. I know, it's stupid, but stupid can be applied to most of LJN's library of games. That is true. And that's still done today, unfortunately. As I said before, 80% of the game is just this, so you better get used to it. Hell, even after you do something that isn't this, you still end up going back to this. LJN didn't even take the time to differentiate these jogging levels. All they did was just change the colors. That would be the same as if Sega were to have made every level in Sonic 1 Green Hill Zone, and all they would have done was just change the colors. It's fucking lazy. You're a slacker. So besides the clock collecting, you also have to avoid stuff. One hit and... Well, you don't lose a life. But you do lose time. And time is basically your life source. Once the time is up, 
or when the picture goes completely black, then you lose a life. The things that you have to avoid are both stationary obstacles as well as moving enemies. Most, if not all, of the enemies aren't even from the film, but the one enemy that I really fucking hate, the one that was just added to the game just for the sake of putting in an extra enemy, are the bees. The fucking bees. These enemies are annoying. What makes them the worst enemy in this game is the fact that they'll follow you. The bees also have a pattern of some sort, but it's really hard to predict, and I think that they're randomized. Also, you have no way to stop jogging, so you're guaranteed to get hit by the bees at least a couple times. I don't think that there exists a person on this planet who has managed to avoid all the bees in this game. Yeah. The soundtrack of this game is yet another problem. Guess how many songs there are? Two. Yeah, a measly two songs, and that's it. And since there are only two songs, you're going to be hearing one of them throughout the game almost non-stop. This one tune is supposed to be an 8-bit rendition of the Huey Lewis and the News song, Power of Love, but it's all fucked up. And it just drones on and on and on and on. It's enough to drive you mad. Here, listen to it. God, that is some bad video game music. And you know, it didn't need to sound like this. This is what the song should have sounded like. Thank you so much, Master Luke 1986, for letting me use your music. Check him out, folks. He's awesome. I'll leave you guys a link to him in the description below. You know, it amazes me how someone on the internet with little to no money can make a better and more faithful 8-bit version of the song Power of Love than a company that had much deeper pockets as well as a full Hollywood studio backing. Again. It's laziness on LJN's end. So we've already established that these jogging levels make up 80% of the game. So what about the other 20%? Well, you're looking at it. These other levels are kind of like mini-games, albeit prolonged ones. The first one takes place in Lou's Cafe, which... That was in the movie, so give LJN some points for consistency. The objective of this level is to throw milkshakes at these bullies here. Or is that supposed to be Biff? Well, if that's the case, then he must have found a way to clone himself. Anyway, this level is stupid. Not because you have to throw things at these enemies, but because you have to hit at least 50 of these enemies before progressing. Like, why such a high number? I can understand hitting 20, maybe 30 of these enemies, but 50? Also, this level is kind of difficult because once you hit around 30 enemies, they start throwing shit back at you. And if you miss just one of these motherfuckers, you get tossed to the wall and lose a life. If you do manage to hit 50 enemies, you progress further into the game. And what's after the cafe? More jogging. Yeah. The next non-jogging level is in the school where you have to catch these hearts that Marty's mom throws at him. This level is just as stupid as Lou's Cafe, but it's a little easier. At least for me it was. After that, more jogging. Again. Next we get to the school dance level. And you know what? I actually like this level. Yeah, amazing. I actually found something in this game that I like.
One of the reasons that I like this level is because the music is different for a change. The song is an 8-bit rendition of Johnny Be Good from the movie, and yeah, as James the Angry Video Game Nerd put it, the song does sound like it's on crack. But to me, that's kind of funny. And like I said, it's definitely a wanted break from that other song. Anyway, the point of this game is to catch these music notes with the guitar, and you do this until the thermometer on the right-hand side of the screen is completely filled. It's kind of like an old-school rhythm game. Think of Guitar Hero before Guitar Hero ever existed. It's hard as hell, but at least it's fun. Sadly, though, this is the only fun that you'll have with this game, and that's even to assume that you'll get this far without giving up on the game altogether. So, after you get through the Johnny B. Good level, then you guessed it, more jogging. I'm sorry, but I can't emphasize it enough on how all this jogging shit is most of the game. This kind of formula would have worked if the game were made on a second generation console like the Atari 2600, but this is an NES game, and the NES was a more advanced console than the 2600 was. Also, this game was released in 1989. There is no excuse for this game being this lackluster. So after this jogging level, we come to the final act of the game where we have to get the DeLorean up to 88 miles an hour so we can get Marty back to 1985. Whilst trying to get the car up to the right speed, you have to dodge these lightning bolts. Why do you have to dodge lightning bolts when it was clearly stated in the movie that they needed lightning in order to get Marty back home? I don't know. It's just another inconsistency to add to the list of inconsistencies that this game has. Anyway, we get the DeLorean to 88 miles, we beat the game, and we're presented with one of the most empty and soulless endings to a video game ever. That song can go die now. The game gets a B for bad. It's not the worst game I've ever played on the NES, but it's a pretty unrecommendable one. But I wanted a second opinion on this game, so we have joining us right now my friend to the very end, Dylan d to Massey. Take it away, Dylan. Hello, everybody. This is d and my good buddy Redneck asked me to review Back to the Future, the NES video game that came out a long time ago. So here we go. Right off the bat, I'm going to say this is the most faithful licensed movie video game I've ever seen. Just like in the movie, Marty's running down the street collecting clocks, dodging a whole bunch of weirdos who are trying to knock him down. And who can forget everyone's favorite scene in the movie where Marty's in a cafe throwing coffees at cloned versions of Biff. Oh, that was a fucked up part of the movie. And also that truly romantic scene where Marty's mom tries to have sex with his own son by shooting hearts at him and Marty reflects it with a book. Oh, jeez. But nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, could beat the ending in this game. It is a scene-by-scene -scene recreation of the original ending to Back to the Future. You know, where the DeLorean speeding down the street trying to get to 88 miles an hour, and the lightning bolts that they're fucking dodging? The dodging, the lightning bolts that's supposed to make the fucking car go into the fucking future. Hopefully you realize the whole fucking thing I've been saying has been being... One big sarcastic big bullshit. This game is fucking garbage. It's complete fucking rubbish. It's garbage. Like, everything about this game, and I mean absolutely everything about this game, has nothing to do with Back to the Future. And I mean absolutely nothing. When you're running down the street and that hula hoop girl knocks you down, she's wearing a blue dress in the movie, not a red... Wait a minute. There is no hula hoop fucking girl knocking you down. This has nothing to do with anything. Basically, this is a cash grab. This is a cash grab piece of crap. <sighs> Realistically, I don't know why anybody would want to play this. Other than to do a quick review, letting everyone know what a piece of shit it is. And then you move on. Because this is not a fucking title that people keep playing. This is not a Super Mario, or Sonic the Hedgehog, or Link from Legend of Zelda. This is fucking E.T. Atari. This is what this is. This is E.T. Atari, but they didn't put it in the landfill. It just slipped through the cracks. <laughs> That's honestly the truth. 
So I'm going to give this a 1 out of 10. The only reason they even give it a 1 is because there's people that actually worked hard on this. And they, you know, they need to feed their families. Or I don't know if there's a Darth Vader thing where they're afraid to be choked out. I don't know what the fuck the situation is. But still, somebody had to take their time to make this piece of shit. Or maybe, just maybe, because I was one of the gullible, stupid little kids that actually rented or bought these stupid licensed video games. I kind of like, you know, have emotional attachment to it a little bit. I remember playing this as a kid. I remember playing all those licensed video games as a kid. And I can tell you that I enjoyed them a lot when I was young. But playing them now? Oh my god, man. I'd rather get kicked in the balls. Like, for real. So, yeah. Redneck, thank you very much for letting me be on your channel. I'm always glad to help you out. Uh, hopefully this review is good enough. You know, I, I, I can only, I only played that game literally for a fucking, like, 20 minutes before I wanted to vomit. So, yeah, anyway, that's my opinion. Thank you very much, guys, and have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you, D-Laps. And you folks make sure to check out his channel. Dylan is a phenomenal reviewer, especially for movies. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description. So, is there anything good I can say about Back to the Future on the NES? Yeah, there is, but a very, very little. The game is actually challenging, so if you're looking for an NES game that's especially hard, then maybe play this game. Another good point about Back to the Future is that it's short. It's bad, but at least it doesn't try to torture you for a prolonged period of time. But probably the worst offense that this game commits is that it's really boring. Like, this is the kind of game that you would put in when it's late at night and you can't seem to get to sleep. Pop this game in and you'll get sleepy in no time. In saying that, I need to play a better NES game now. Something that's not tedious. Something more engaging. Something that was made by people that actually gave a damn about what they were making. Something like... Something like this. <laughs>